Hello and welcome to Debating 101. I'm going to give you today a little overview of British parliamentary debating. We're going to go through the format, that is how a debate will run. We're going to go through speaker roles, where depending on where on the table, the individual task that you're going to have. We're going to go through the basics of forming an argument and we're going to give you a basic speech structure that you can use to structure your speeches. The format runs like this. You are in a team of two. Uh, you, within this team, are going to be assigned to one of four uh, stages on the table. Opening government, closing government, opening opposition, closing opposition. Within that, you are, amongst your team, allowed to pick whether you want, who wants to speak first and who wants to speak second. Uh, but the government sides must, of course, defend the motion, and the opposition sides must, of course, attack the motion. Um, try and convince us it's not true. Or it's not the best thing. Your speaking order starts with the Prime Minister and then moves down the table. Prime Minister, Leader of Opposition, Deputy Prime Minister, Deputy Leader of Opposition, Member of Government, Member of Opposition, Government Whip, Opposition Whip. And each speaker has a slightly different role to fulfil and slightly different things that they need to do. We're going to go through those now, starting with Prime Minister. The Prime Minister must define any terms. If there's an ambigu ambiguous term in the motion, uh, they should uh, tell us what it is. For example, a motion may refer to criminals, and the Prime Minister may wish to tell us whether that is anyone who has ever committed a crime, or whether that is people who have been convicted of crime. Two different definitions of criminal, they should tell us which one they are arguing for. They should also give a mechanism. Uh, what's a mechanism? Well, a mechanism is when a motion reads something like, this house would, the government has a burden to tell us how they would carry out that policy. For example, this house would raise taxes. You are going to have to tell me how much they're raising taxes, probably who's going to collect the taxes, something about enforcement. The idea, general ideas like that, uh, general ideas of how the motion is going to come about, what action is going to be taken to give the motion, um, to make the motion happen. Your Leader of Opposition, Deputy Prime Minister and Deputy Leader of Opposition generally do the same thing. They're going to provide some rebuttal, that is counter-arguments, arguing against things that have already been said on the table, and they're going to provide some new arguments of their own. Exception to this is Leader of Opposition, who has a duty that if the Prime Minister has not given definitions uh, and mechanisms, or has given definitions and mechanisms that are blatantly wrong or blatantly not in the spirit of the debate, the Leader of the Opposition has a duty to give their own version of what that would be that the debate can then run for, with in order to have a clean and steady debate. Interrupting our presentation today, just as they will interrupt your speech, is a point of information. A point of information is a way for you to interact with the person who is currently speaking. It works lastly. You will stick up your hand and say, point of information. It is then completely at the discretion of the person speaking whether they wish to accept that point of information, whether they wish to decline that point of information. A point of information is a question, a statement, anything that you want, uh, and so long as it is within 15 seconds. You should try and interact with what the person on who is currently speaking is saying, give them something new to consider, remind them of a point that you said previously, uh, give them the rebuttal that you're currently thinking of, all those sorts of things. This is to foster what we call engagement and make sure that everyone is uh, arguing with each other, not just past each other. Then we move on to the back half of the debate, where we have the Member of Government and Member of Opposition. These two positions must do something crucial. They must bring something new. Uh, anything said by the opening half uh, that is said by the back half will not be credited in the back half. It will only be credited to the opening half. So the um, white half must talk about something new, and they should talk about also how they are different from their opening. They should explicitly say, uh, our opening talked about individuals, but we are talking about systems, something like that. And they also can't contradict their opening. So if their opening said that something was that one particular thing was going to happen, and that was bad, and you and the back half want to say, uh, something different will happen, the original thing won't happen, and it would be worse, uh, that would be bad, that would be contradicting your opening, you would not be credited for that. 
don't do that. Finally, we move into the last two speakers, the government and opposition whips. The most crucial thing about the whips, they cannot bring anything new. Why is this? This is because if the opposition whip were allowed to bring anything new, there would be no one speaking after them to rebut it, and so it would not be fair on the debate, because there would then be material in the debate that no one had the chance to engage with. And to make it fair between government and opposition, the government whip runs under the same rules as the opposition whip. So they cannot bring anything. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to compare arguments. You're going to tell me why the arguments already brought up by your partner, who just went, is better than everything else on the table. You can strengthen them, you can uh, show how, uh, give examples to support them, but you can't bring, the bring in new arguments. You can also take down opposing arguments. So you can say that my partner bring, bring, brought the best arguments, and this is because every other argument on the table was nonsense. And I'm now going to tell you why, and then explain why all the other arguments were nonsense. Uh, and then you reach the end of the debate. So, what are these arguments? What are the things that we're talking about here? In debating, you are always comparing two worlds. Every debate has a change to the status quo. So you, if your motion is, this house would do something, you are comparing the world in which that thing is done versus the current world, where it's not done. Therefore, you've got two worlds. You've got your status quo and you've got your counterfactual. Your counterfactual being the world where something has changed. And you need to tell me why the world on your side of the debate, why the side that you're um, defending, has the better world. She brings up an interesting question. What do we mean by better? We've got two main ways of quantifying this. One is utilitarian, one is principled. We'll go through these in turn. Your utilitarian uh, framework is generally the most good for the most people, and your principles are generally anything else. Your utilitarianism is going to have several metrics. You're going to talk about impact size. You're going to talk about the number of people who are affected, and you're going to talk about the amount they're affected. I think it is relatively intuitive that it is better to give one person a hundred pounds than it is to give them ten pounds, all things being equal. But also that it is better probably to give a thousand people ten pounds than it is to give one person a hundred pounds. And you might have to weigh these things up. You might have to give me the comparisons of those, right? Um, you will also have to talk about how important things are to people's lives. You're going to have to tell me about how much it makes someone happier, how much it improves their lives. Um, and this is where we get one of the basic ideas of debating, that if you give £100 to someone who has £1,000, that is more effective than giving £100 to someone who has a million pounds, because they're more likely to be able to do good things with them. It's more likely to improve their lives. So this is the framework that you will think a lot of arguments in naturally. This is the framework that a lot of arguments work in. But it's not the only framework, because there's a second way to go through it. Principles, what you ought to do. So a principle is something that you just think should happen. And they are usually counter to your utilitarian metrics. For example, we would, most of us, think it is wrong to take one person kill them, harvest their organs, and use those organs to save five other people. This is something that we don't do, this is something that would generally be wrong. However, under a utilitarian framework, that would be good, because more people are alive um, under the side where you kill someone and versus the side where you don't kill someone. But we have other principles. We have the principle of the right to life, the right to bodily autonomy, all that sort of thing. Some other ones you might talk about is the right to self-defense, the idea of democracy being a principle that must be upheld, um, freedom, those sorts of things. And you will have to talk about these and tell me why they are the most important thing, why you think people should value them more. It is important here to note that in debating, you are trying to convince your averagely intelligent global citizen, that is someone who has no particular place, no particular preconceptions, a base level of knowledge on general things, and tell that person why you think your side is better, and convince the judges that that person would think your side is better. So most people do value the right to life. Most people do think that you shouldn't uh, kill that one person to save that five. Therefore, principles are very valid. Though, 
also, most people do like utilitarian ideas. Do you think that you should increase happiness for everyone? Great. So, now that we know what we're trying to drive at, what we're trying to prove, that your world is better, how do you prove that? Your motion is always going to have people taking actions. Almost nothing changes without people taking actions, and all of our debates revolve around it. Those actions are going to have effects. Those effects might have knock-on effects, more effects, more effects. They're eventually going to lead to an impact. Your impact is the thing that you try and show is good or bad. Is your more people being happy, or is your principle being violated? Whichever one of those that you are going for. And to get there, we're going to need to ask a very important question. Why does this happen? Because it is crucial to know that everything happens for a reason. Everything can be reasoned out. We don't always know those reasons, but they do happen for a reason. And for debating, the most persuasive arguments are going to be those that can show me a clear logical chain, where I can not ask, why does this thing happen? Because you've already told me why it happens. And so you're going to have to justify each of the steps on, along your line. If you're trying to prove that uh, giving money to uh, people is good, you're going to tell me uh, what they're going to do with that money and then why the stuff they're going to do with that money is good. Right? And give me that logical chain in order to prove the point that you're trying to make, in order to prove your impact. And finally, we move on to a quick little speech structure. Uh, this is for people reading new material, so not really applicable for WIPs, but will apply to most of your other speeches. You should spend a little bit of time at the beginning, probably, on rebuttal. If you're Prime Minister, this is the time that you'd li most likely spend giving your definitions, giving your mechanisms. You then should give us one to two arguments. This argument should have your initial claim, so like, I'm going to tell you today that uh, doing this thing is good. You're then going to tell me anything that we need to know before you start your argument. So uh, this is because this thing is... Um, I, I think this thing is achievable. I think this thing is uh, of a, any sort of nature. You're then going to give me your arguments. So that is your linking before. That is your telling me why something happens. Going through those logical steps. Proving that it will definitely happen. Uh, to your satisfaction, and then you're going to link it back to the motion. So remember that you're always trying to prove the motion or disprove the motion. So you want to then tell me, now that you've proved that something is going to happen, tell me if it's good or bad, tell me that it happens because of the motion, clearly, and then put that in the context of the debate and tell me why you win the debate. Relatively simple. And finally, it is recommended that you take at least one POI per speech. POIs are important to allow you to engage with the other people on the table and to not just have your argument standing in isolation, but to have it challenged and to have it relevant within the rest of the debate. So, hopefully that's enough to get you started. Thank you very much.